Turn the key, pull the starter. The car we're featuring today, or the chassis we're featuring today, is a Model J Duesenberg. Technically, it's a 1931, although almost all Model J Duesenbergs were built in 1928 and 1929. What they did back in the day was they would title a car for the year it was sold. Technically, this is a 1928 car, but if you didn't sell it until 1931, it was a 1931 car. That's just the way they did it back in the day. And they would do updates occasionally. Uh, Duesenberg ran to about 1937. And what they would do was just refresh in chassis and change wheels. Sometimes even taking old cars and putting different bodies on them. Anything to do to stay in business. They had hoped to build and sell about 500 cars a year, but the depression hit in 29. And it took 10 years to sell the, what, something like 470 that they made. Legendary car, the most powerful American car ever built up to that point. To give you an idea, the Chrysler Imperial, their selling point in the 30s was the most powerful car sold in America with 112 horsepower. This had 265. It is a straight eight engine. It is a twin cam, four valve per cylinder. The Duesenberg brothers were race car designers and engineers. They only built the this particular model because E.L. Cord went to them and bought the company and said, look, I don't care what it costs, build the fastest, most powerful American car that you can. And that's what they did using race car techniques. You know, Packard and all the other companies had their big V12s and whatnot. And those were side valve engines, flathead engines, if you will. Uh, the advantage of a flathead is extremely quiet. These were really big in Hollywood and in Texas and were People like to go fast and show off, and uh, much like Ferrari or Lamborghini or any of the exotics today, this was a true American exotic. In fact, this is the most powerful American engine ever built up until the Chrysler Hemi cars of the 1950s. Extremely sophisticated motor, four-wheel hydraulic disc brakes. Duesenberg was the first American manufacturer to use hydraulic brakes. He didn't patent it. I think he would have been a gazillionaire if he did but he just didn't. The reason it is a chassis is because that's the way I bought it. This had a big Willoughby sedan, one of those big town car bodies on it. The wheelbase on this is 153 and a half inches. This is the long wheelbase car. The short wheelbase car was, uh, I think, 142 and a half inches. But even that was pretty big. I mean, a Cadillac was like 124 inches. So that shows you how much bigger it was. And it's amazing how fast this thing is without a, without a body on it. You take that 2,500 pound body off this thing and it really, really flies. Although this is a very heavy car by modern standards, it was not as heavy as a lot of cars back in the day. A lot of exotic materials used in this, although the engine is, and this head is just cast iron. To get this head off, you need like three guys. It's like 200 pounds. I mean, it's, it's amazing how heavy it is. And the casting of these engines, it cost them a fortune. I'm not sure if Duesenberg ever made any money selling these because they probably, even though the chassis alone was over $9,000, which doesn't sound like a lot now, but when you realize you could buy a Ford for $260, <laughs> that's, uh, that's pretty amazing. The average house is around $1,200 to $2,000 back in the day. So the fact that one of these out the door with a body on it, the cheapest you'd get it was thirteen dollars to 14000 and they went as high as 25000 and even higher. Let me show you some of the novel features of this engine. This is kind of interesting. Right here, this is your dipstick. There is no traditional dipstick in the Duesenberg. You just have this gauge that tells you how much oil you have in here. It works on a float. But when you change the oil in the Duesenberg, what you do is you just flip this lever 
and it opens a valve and it empties into a receptacle. You don't have to get underneath it. You're not unscrewing anything. Oil filters on the other side. So you just let that drain, shut it, and then right here, you fill it with oil again. This is your intake here. Uh, this car, this engine was restored by our good friend Randy Ema. He's probably the world's greatest Duesenberg expert and historian. He has all the original factory papers and everything. It was too rare to attempt to play with here at the garage. So we sent it to Randy and uh, he, he's the expert and does a wonderful job. This is your intake manifold. Now this has water running through it to help heat the carburetor, you know, for warm-ups and whatnot. We've bypassed the water just because this is aluminum. We didn't want it to corrode and we don't really need it. You've got a Schliebner carburetor here. This is what they call an updraft carburetor. This is still the 20s, don't forget. The reason this is an updraft carburetor is because when you shut this car off, a certain amount of gas will drip down onto the ground. That's what they did back in the days. So obviously, environmentally, you can't do that anymore. So they switched to what they call a downdraft. A downdraft carburetor is better because the fuel gravity feeds into the engine, but if the needle and seat are not good, well, then the fuel can, when the engine's not running, the fuel can seep past the needle and seat, get into the cylinder, fill the cylinder with gas, and either turn the key and blow the whole thing up or hydraulic because it can't compress. So that's what this does. It just let it strain. That's why this has a downdraft carburetor. It's a pretty sophisticated piece of equipment. You have three fuel pumps, two electric and one manual. And you've got this here. This is a hand pump. So you can shoot some fuel in there if you want. This is your generator right here, your float bowl. Uh, this is your ignition up here. I've done some modifications. This, this is for your advance and retard, as you can see. This moves the distribu distributor. This is still before they had uh, full automatic advance. Uh, this is cast aluminum firewall, which is pretty amazing, too. Relay box up here. Uh, this is your chassis lubricator. As you can see, it's not connected here just because we don't really need it. The reason I have these covers on the lights is because the tires throw up stones and I didn't want them to dent this. I can't remember why they added this Duesenberg emblem. The early cars didn't have it, but you know, Rolls-Royce, Hispano Suez, all the fancy car companies had an emblem, so you figured, okay, why not? It'd be nice to impale a pedestrian on there every now and then. Uh, cooling systems, I think about seven gallons of water. Oh, this is kind of cool. This is your thermostat. See these here? When the car is cold, those close. As it heats up through this lever here, it automatically opens the vents to let cool air in. It's basically a mechanical thermostat. Seems a lot more complicated than just having a thermostat in the radiator, and it was, and most people did not uh, keep that too long. This is a cover. You could turn the engine over by hand. If you could turn this engine over by hand, I'm not going to get in a fight with you, okay, because this is a, this is a big motor. This chassis as it sits is probably close to 4,000 pounds, probably 3,700. And with another body on it, it would go out the door at about 5,200 pounds, which was considered not heavy in the day because there were plenty of cars that were way heavier at seven, 8,000 pounds. But this, this is the one engine that could do it. You know, this is the only uh, antique car I have that you can drive like a modern car. You can take this out in the freeway, 75, 80, easily tops 100, no problem. These would do 89 in second gear, and the supercharged car would do 96 in seven, second gear. They were all three speeds. Duesenberg's originally left the factory with four-speed transmissions, but they didn't have a transmission that could take the torque and the power. There'd never been an engine like this before, and consequently, they would just break under load. So what they did was they just took a good old-fashioned non-synchro mesh three-speed transmission and adapted it to this. I think it was off one of the trucks, but I'm not really sure. And consequently, in the late 30s or middle 30s, when synchro mesh became available in Cadillac and Packard and all the other makes, Duesenberg didn't have that. And it made them seem a little old-fashioned. Although they had the most sophisticated engine of anybody, the transmission probably was, although strong, was not particularly sophisticated and they didn't have the funds to upgrade it to make it uh, a synchromesh unit. Missing here is the timing box. The timing box connects onto here. This car doesn't have it because it didn't have it when I got it. But what that does is on a Duesenberg, it's really pretty interesting. It's a set of planetary gears and it 
lights four lights on the dashboard. Every 700 miles, a light comes on to tell you to change the oil, because you change the oil every 700 miles, which seems unbelievable now, but that's what you had to do back in the day. Every 75 miles, another light would come on, and the automatic pump would shoot lubrication to all the chassis points to lubricate the car. At 14 to 1500 miles, another light would come on to tell you to put water in the battery, and then there was another light to come on to tell you when this Bajour automatic lubrication system was working. As you can see, that's not hooked up, and the timing box is not hooked up. This one we run just as a chassis, which is a lot of fun, because it's like the ultimate hot rod. These went, as I said, 89 miles per hour in second gear with a huge body on it. So it's, you'll see how fast it is in just a minute. We'll, we'll take it for a ride. Let me show what I was talking about on the dashboard. Uh, there are a few things missing on this car, as I said, like that timing box. Uh, the horn should be here. We have it on the dash here, and we have a hand throttle, which would normally be up here, as well as advance and retard control. <laughs> Uh, these are the four lights I told you about for uh, chassis lubrication, change engine oil, check battery, uh, Bajour lubrication system. Do some I had something fascinating. This is a very early anti-lock brake system. You notice it says dry, rain, snow, and ice. And the idea being that you turn a valve and it would regulate how much brake fluid went to that particular area. For example, if you put it on, turn this to ice, you could step on the brake all the way and it would, it would reduce the amount of fluid so it would keep the, the tires from locking up so you could slow down. Then on dry service, when you wanted optimum braking, you would turn it all the way and the pedal would get hard. And you could adjust your braking that way, which is pretty cool. In fact, you had a gauge here that tells you how many pounds of pressure you're applying. See, there's 400 pounds of pressure, there's 500 pounds of pressure, there's 200 pounds of pressure, depending on how hard you press the pedal. This is your uh, ammeters here, amperage gauge. This is your um, tachometer, went to 5,000, which was unbelievable back in the day. These made 265 horsepower at 4,250 RPM, as I remember. This is your fuel gauge. It's one of those ether deals with gas. It doesn't quite work. Uh, you had your, your clock right here, uh, oil pressure gauge, speedometer, uh, odometer, tripometer, temperature, and altimeter. Why you have an altimeter in a car? It was kind of a gimmicky thing. Don't forget, this is 1928-1929. Lindbergh had just flown the ocean, which was the equivalent of uh, literally going to the moon back in the day. So everybody wanted airplane style dashboards. So you got an altimeter to see how high you were from sea level. It was just one of those things that was kind of cool to have. Big railroad style handbrake, three speed transmission. Uh, as you see the foot pedal, it kind of matches your foot uh, and clutch and brake are in the traditional places. This is a chassis we modified just so we could drive it on the street. So we added the box in the back and the wood here on the sides. But it's, uh, it's just about ready to go for a ride. So, uh, well, you got to see this thing on the road. It's, this is so much fun. You know, this is what they did when you bought a Duesenberg. Uh, they would take the chassis to Indianapolis Speedway because their shop was right around the corner. And they would run every chassis around the Speedway to make sure it was up to par. These were guaranteed to do well over 100 miles an hour when most cars could barely go a mile a minute. I mean, 60 miles an hour was really fast. The speed limit in 28 was, I think, 19, 1928, I think, was what, 35 miles an hour, maybe 45 max. That was the maximum. So a mile a minute was pretty fast. So this going 100 miles an hour, that was just, that was inconceivable to people at the time. It just seemed unbelievable. This was the true first, at least, American supercar. This was the one that could take on the best of Europe and, and what the rest of the world had to offer. So, uh, well, you'll see how she goes in just a second. Well, this also has an exhaust cutout on the floor, but we've bypassed that. So there are a few modifications to this car. Turn the key, pull the starter. This will be fun. I can't imagine how 
more exciting than this must have been to drive in 1928. When you think about it, it was really pretty close to the most powerful car in the world. I mean, the SSK Mercedes, I think it was about 180 horse. The Bentley 8 liter was about 200 horse, maybe 220. This is 265, and supercharged, it was 320. It'd be fun to get a race, get those three cars together and, and see how they do. And of course, without a 2,500 pound body on it, oh my God, this thing just flies. Believe me, 100 miles an hour in this chassis, is, it feels like 200 in the McLaren. the racing heritage. Duesenberg won Indianapolis a whole bunch of times. And if they didn't win, they certainly placed second, third, or fourth. They were race car engineers. And when E.L. Cord came to them and said they were, they were building the Model X Duesenberg. See, the trouble with Duesenberg was they were engine guys and suspension guys. They weren't designers. So when they built their first Duesenberg, which is a straight eight single cam, very exciting engine, had hydraulic brakes and everything, but kind of frumpy looking, not the, not the coolest looking thing out there. And as like most great engineers, they weren't good businessmen. So E.L. Cord came to them and said, listen, uh, stop what you're working on. They were building a Model X Duesenberg. And they said, we want, I want you to build the fastest, most powerful American luxury car ever built. And that's what they did. In fact, the last Model X they built is sitting in my garage right now. It's unrestored. It's right in the line there, right 1927 four-door sedan. This car came out. It had twice the horsepower of the next biggest engine car in America, the Imperial. It had six times the horsepower of a Play Ford. This was just seen as something like from another planet. And extremely complicated to work on. To adjust these valves, it's a 40-hour job. It literally has 40 hours. <laughs> That's a whole work week just to adjust the valve. But on the plus side, they said they could go 10,000 miles between valve adjustments. Like Combing built these engines in Pennsylvania, they also did aircraft engines. And they probably threw away, oh, probably two or three blocks for every one they actually used. This is an extremely complicated engine and head to cast. In fact, a good friend of mine who has since passed away, a wonderful guy named Jim Snack, he remanufactured some Duesenberg heads because there are an awful lot of cars out there that weren't running anymore. The heads were about $42,000 a piece. I think he lost money in every one. But you still had to do the finishing uh, rework on it, you know, finish machining and all on it. But thanks to him, a lot of Duesenberg engines are still running, so we thank him for that. But it has such a great sound, you know? Most engines on this period run out of steam above 2,500 RPM, whereas this thing just keeps pulling. Look at that. It's just hard to explain how much fun this is to drive. It's like the ultimate convertible. We got a, had a little fun looking at this piece of history. You know, so many of these Duesenbergs, they just sit in museums and they put a velvet rope around them. People walk and look and they get no sense of how they sound and how they feel, even what they smell like, you know. And it's, it's great fun to take it down the road and use it for the purpose for which it was intended. And that's what's kind of fun about this. This isn't some pristine show car, it's just a chassis. So you can take it out and run it up to four grand or 4,500 and 
this thing's been over 100 miles an hour a number of times, and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's just a lot of fun to drive. So I, I, I hope you enjoyed this piece of history, and uh, if you've got to do something, get out there and use it. See you guys next week. Thanks. <laughs>